So, what's wrong with the world, Doug? Yeah, besides everything? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's wrong with the world is we rebelled against God. So, 10 minutes after the world went wrong in the Garden of Eden, it didn't look like the world had gone wrong. It still looked like paradise. Yeah. So, uh, when our first parents disobeyed in the Garden, it didn't go from color to black and white. It, you know, it was still a glorious, beautiful world. But things started to come unraveled, started to come unstuck. Uh, in fact, it got so bad before the flood that God wiped the antediluvian civilization out. It was so bad and yeah. erased the memory of them. And then the whole thing started over again, built up. So you had the great pagan empires of Babylon and uh, Greece and Rome. And in the middle of that, God, back in Genesis, God had promised a Messiah. So he was going to let he was going to let us run out to the end of our tether, you know. So we rebelled and just, uh, just um, made a glorious mess. And so the Lord Jesus um, came, and born of a virgin, born of a woman, born under the law, and he said, just as the principle of sin had to work its way out over centuries, so God wanted a pinprick of righteousness to work its way out. So there was um, one act of uh, disobedience that grew into ever-increasing wickedness. Yeah. And then the Lord Jesus was born and lived a perfect sinless life and died on the cross. The first Adam di uh, disobeyed at a tree and the second Adam obeyed on a tree, mm. right? And God reversed everything from that point. But the reversal was like the devil, the, the, the reversal was like the catastrophe at the beginning. Okay. Everything didn't, you know, so 10 minutes after Adam and Eve sinned, it wasn't like you know, the day you eat of the fruit of the tree, you shall surely die. Well, we're still here. Maybe the serpent was right. And, yeah. You know, that sort of thing. But they, were, they died. They were separated from God. 10 minutes after Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples could look around and say, well, everything's pretty much the same old world. Yep. Right? Same old world. Um, it looked like nothing was done. It look, looked like nothing was done. Yeah. Except Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a, a, a woman put into you know, flour. So you put, the king, you put the kingdom of God in that, and it slowly, inexorably works out over time. It's like a mustard seed that grows, uh, or it's like a rock that's cut uh, without hands in Daniel, and it grows to become a mountain that fills the whole earth. Right. So all of it is gradual, methodical, and inexorable. Yeah. So boring. Yeah. To some people. Yeah. And you could always say you could always say, well, it's pretty much the same as it was 5 years ago. Mm -hmm. Right? And you can always, you can find stretches where it's worse now than it was 5 years ago or worse now than it was 50 years ago. But that's because we're not thinking big enough. We're not thinking in big enough increments. Yeah. Um, look at human history in 500-year increments. And uh, and it becomes apparent that yeah. the Christ's kingdom is growing and advancing and is conquering and will and will conquer. Yeah. So what's wrong with the world? Disobedience, sin, rebellion. What's right with the world? The obedience of Christ, which is sort of the, the pitch that he hit that enables us to imitate him. So because he obeyed, that imputation is imp that obedience is imputed to us and then we're set free, forgiven, so that we can risk obedience. Okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, because if, if my salvation, if my justification depended in any way on my works, <laughs> I don't want to risk it. Yeah. Because uh, I'm going to screw it up. You know, I'm gonna, I'd, I'd be damned for my good days. And, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. And, and so um, what Jesus does by his death, burial, resurrection is he provides a free forgiveness that means that I'm set free to be grateful and, I'm, and I can risk obedience. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why the kingdom of God grows s as slowly as it does, but also as steadily as it does. Mm -hmm. That's right. So there's this popular view, the view that the kingdom of God's going to drop kind of all at once. Right. And that's coming soon. Right. Maybe. Maybe. Um, and, uh, and then when it gets to soon isn't the time. It's later, a little right. later. And but the idea is it's going to drop on history, and that's where Jesus is really going to rule 
in the way that he was intended to rule uh, through all those prophecies. Yeah, except that the, Jesus never says the kingdom of God cometh like the 82nd Airborne. That's right. That's right. <laughs> right? It's, it's not a coup de main. It's not an inv a full force invasion. Right. Yeah, um, the thing that the, I shared a lot of the assumptions of, of the outlook that you're talking about, and then I couldn't, I couldn't get it to come out of Scripture. I understood the system, but I, I couldn't get it from Scripture. So I tried, to, I tried to be nothing for a while, sort of an eschatological agnostic. Yeah. Uh, I'd say, Jesus is coming again, don't push me. You know, the, the, that's all I know. Yeah. Um, and I was reading in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, in, I was in that frame of mind. And I was reading in 1 Corinthians 15. And it said, for he must reign until he has put his en all his enemies under his feet. And that's, of course, Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until mm -hmm. I make your enemies. He doesn't say, sit at my right hand until it's time for you to smack down your enemies and then you go subdue them. Yeah. The Lord says, sit at my right hand until your enemies are made a footstool. And so, I was, so that, that verse snapped in my head, for he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. And I realized that when he comes, he's going to destroy the last enemy, death. Mm -hmm. But in the, the system I'd been taught, he would have to, the first enemy to be destroyed would be death. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So if everything's just going from bad to worse, the, words, the world's a hell hole. And then finally Jesus comes back and the first thing that happens is the resurrection of the dead. The first, mm -hmm. first thing that happens is that death is destroyed. But Paul says the last thing that happens is that death is destroyed. Yeah. All the lesser enemies of Christ, every vain thought, every, um, every system of unbelief, as it says in 2 Corinthians 10, we, we are taking every thought captive. That, that's what we're about. Every disobedience captive. We want to subdue everything to Christ, knowing that we can't, without his personal reappearing, we can't destroy, we can't take out the last redoubt. Yep. We, we can't take out the last fortress of the enemy, which is death. But we can take out all the others, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we do it through gospel preaching, we do it through church planting, we do it through worship, we do it through evangelism and apologetics. It's, it's peaceful. Yeah. It, it's, not, uh, it's not an imposition from the top. It's gospel driven. Our weapons are not carnal, uh, but they're powerful yeah. for, for throwing down strongholds. So I, I believe that we are in a period of great opportunity where we have many, many enemies before us that gives us something to do. <laughs> right. right. Uh, there, I, one of my favorite stories, uh, there's a Marine general in the Korean War. It was, uh, we had pushed the Koreans back up into North Korea and then the Chinese came into the war. And this Marine general was surrounded, his unit was completely surrounded. Chinese every, you know, just overwhelmingly surrounded. And he looked around at all of the adversary and he said, well, they can't get away now. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. All right, that, that's how Christians need to think. That's right. Right. Um, here's another example from history. Uh, Latimer and Ridley were great uh, bishops in, in the uh, English Reformation, and they were burned to the stake um, by Bloody Mary. And when they were, they were together, about to be burned, and Latimer says, play the man, Master Ridley. We shall today light such a candle as by God's grace as I trust, it, such a candle in England as I trust by God's grace shall never be put out. Mm -hmm. So he's about to be burned at the stake. And he is saying, in effect, we've got them now. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> right? We've yeah. got them now. Well, what, what kind of faith can do that, can talk that way? Well, only Christian faith can talk that way. Yeah. Right? And you hit what you aim at. If, if Christians believe that we're just going to lose, you've probably played on sports teams that everybody on the team is convinced that you're going to lose. Well, guess what? You're going to lose because you're going into it. Mm -hmm. You're thinking that way. Mm -hmm. um, but suppose, suppose God has promised us that we're going to win. W what would that look like? Yeah. And w why don't we take his promises at face value? Suppose, suppose the Great Commission will be successfully fulfilled and all the nations will be discipled, yeah. and they will, be, they will all be baptized, and they will all be taught obedience to everything Jesus has spoken. Suppose when Jesus told us to do that, he meant that we were supposed to do that. Yeah, <laughs> right. But we'd like to go key off of what we see with our eyes. 
mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I, I like to say, you know, David went out to meet Goliath and everybody in the Israelite army was saying, that giant's too big to fight. And David is thinking, well, that giant's too big to miss. Yes. <laughs> That's right. right. That's right. So, so he side of a barn. Look at that. Look yeah. <laughs> look, at that. <laughs> look at that guy. Yeah. And, and so, um, why why is it that we think that size matters? What matters is, is the promises of God. That's yes, right. Right. Yeah. If God has promised it, then uh, if God has promised it, then there's nothing they can do to withstand it. That's right. If God has not promised it, there's nothing we can do to bring it about. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. You were there. Yeah. I was there. Same thing. I believed right. a certain thing about the future and what was ahead of us, mm -hmm. and I couldn't get it out of Scripture. I started right. seeing things that were conflicting with what I was, what I was mm -hmm. believing. So I started going back to Scripture saying, now I was taught all that in Bible college, right. but I can't really see it. But is, is that text actually saying what I was taught? Right. It is saying. So I always try to get across to people who are now saying, okay, let's, let me, let me, what does the Scripture say? I said, well, okay, well, the Bible tells us, promised to Abraham, he would have descendants as numerous as the stars. That's a lot of stars. It's yeah. a lot of descendants. You can't see if you want to at the end of history. Yeah. If you want to see the whole church, yeah. you're going to need a Hubble yeah. telescope. Yeah. They said that's a lot. That's, that's a grand. Lot. Yeah. And then you move forward. You have promises that are so abundant it's difficult to even dis dis discuss. Just promises of the nations coming, all the nations returning to the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And then the premier text that you quoted from from First Corinthians 15, Psalm 110:1. This is the most popular Bible verse. It's God's favorite Bible verse. It's the one he quotes the most from in the New yeah. Testament. Sit on my right hand, tell him make your enemies a footstool for your right. feet. And uh, you have text after text after text talking about the kingdom of the Messiah coming into history, his rule coming into history. And it actually says things like you brought up Daniel 2, a stone that becomes yeah. a mountain. So small to large. Yeah. Isaiah 9, popular Christmas verse uh, of the increase of his government yeah, and of there peace. There'll be no the government end. will be on his shoulders. That's right, and, yeah. and it increases, it grows, and you have Jesus coming to talk about it like a mustard seed that becomes a tree, leaven and a lump of dough. And so you uh. see there's a steady thing of progress that takes place in the Scriptures in, ter in terms of how this kingdom is going to grow. Now, yeah. Jesus said he brought it. The apostles say he brought it. The Bible says it had to come in that time period, and here we are yeah. under the rule of Christ. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, yes, but that the world through him might be saved. So if I say God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, and I say stop right there, what do most Christians think Jesus is going to do when everything's said and done? Yeah. Condemn the world. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. They, they, they say Jesus is going to come again, and then boy, you know, They're it's, in for a, it. that's, it's all over except for 15 or 16 of the faithful. Yeah. For, <laughs> yeah. Right? So, but that, that's an admission of defeat. God's declared purpose was I'm gonna, that world, that world is a mess and I am gonna glorify my name by saving it. Yeah. So he could, he could glorify his justice by destroying us in our rebellion or he could glorify his mercy by saving us. But he can't glorify anything by trying to save it and failing. Yeah. Right? That's right. right? So um, if, Jesus, if Jesus says God, uh, is, God's intention is not to con condemn the world, I believe that I'm living in a world that is not condemned, right? This is the propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world, right? So I am laboring in a saved world, declaring salvation to them, because they must believe in order to appropriate it. Right. They must believe. But it's the tension you see in 2 Corinthians 5, where um, God was, for God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Therefore we plead with you, be reconciled. Yeah. To, to God. So our plea w to non-believers is to be reconciled to a God who is already reconciled to the planet you live on. You know, God has already purchased the world. Um, he's already purchased the nations. He's already purchased all of these uh, tribes and languages and kindred with his own blood. So you, why don't you come along quietly? <laughs> Just put down your gun. You know? <laughs> Stop the warning. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I, I think we ought to think more of non-believers as like that Japanese soldier in the Philippines who came down out of the jungle in the 1970s. You know, in the 1970s, he comes down and finally surrenders decades after the war is over. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, I think that that's how we ought to think of the futility of unbelief. Yeah. Unbelievers can't 
manage the world. They can't govern the world. They can't control the world. They aspire to deity, and it's a sorcerer's apprentice sort of thing. Everything comes apart. Yeah, that's right. And the reason we let it happen is because the Christians have sort of backed away from their confidence and their joy and their gladness, which would all be grounded in the promises of God for history. And when Jesus ascends, he comes up to the Ancient of Days, he's given a kingdom. Daniel right. 7, 13 through 14 was that the, the Son of Man comes up to the Ancient of Days and is given a kingdom, dominion and a glory that, that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him, a dominion that's everlasting and never passes away, a kingdom that's never destroyed. Jesus, he, he goes up, but before he does, he says, all authority mm -hmm. in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Right. And so all this belongs to Jesus, right. whether people accept it or not. Right. He is the Lord of the world. He's King of right. kings, Lord of lords today. So, okay, so here's the problem though, Doug, and this is what everybody always faces. I faced it. I'm sure you probably had these thoughts too. You finally realize that wow, Jesus really is the King of the world and, and he's made promises about what he's gonna do to redeem mm -hmm. and save and we can trust he's sovereign. He can accomplish everything. He can give the gifts of faith and repentance. He really can, no one can stop him. But then you look around and you say, Man, this place it broke down and it's... It's a mess. The first question everyone asks me, Doug, is they always say, okay, I see it. They say, but what does that mean? How much longer do we have to go? What do you think? And I always say, I think what you say often too, is I think we're in the infancy of the church. We have a long way to go. Right. So here's what I want to ask you. Tell me about raking rocks. I was uh, building my house with my son, Nate, and we, had, uh, we were getting ready for concrete pour. Yeah. And we were building the house, paying as as we went and sometimes okay. we had time to work and sometimes we had money and some you know yeah. it was like a three-legged race at the fair and and uh, so one time I was up there with Nate and said okay well, let's rake this gravel and and Nate said dad I'm pretty sure that we've raked this gravel already that we've leveled it out and we've raked it and I said well let's rake the let's rake the, rake the gravel anymore because I didn't um, that's all I had to do and, and Nate said, why are we raking the gravel? We already raked the gravel. And I said, well, we have gravel and we have rakes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, yeah. all, that's all we have, yeah. all right? So if I had more, I'd do more. Right. But I want to be faithful with what I've got. Yeah. So um, to who much is given, much is required. You want to live up to what you've already attained. If you've got uh, two pennies and you're a widow lady, um, you throw those two pennies into the into the temple treasury in front of Jesus, not knowing that he's there, yeah. and you make it into the Bible, <laughs> yep. right? That's right, right. right? Yeah. So, and your faith is held out as a model to the end of the world. Yeah. And it was just two pennies, right? That was her rake and gravel. That was, that was, that was her um, gift, that was her sacrifice. So what you, you, you wanna be at your station, at your post, doing what God called you to do. Yeah. And, and then he's the general, we're not the generals. So all we, we're the foot soldiers. We're, yeah. we're the ones who need to be obedient where we are and let him sort out the big, you know, the, the big picture. Yeah, but it's meaningful to rake rocks. Yes. If that's what God has given you to do, to bring glory to himself, because he has a plan in that land that he's given you. Yeah. And if it means you're raking rocks for now, it's okay, right. one day there'll be a house. Yeah. Oh yeah, you yeah. Know. yeah. It, the, uh, another illustration, I, when I was in the Navy, I was on a submarine. And um, when a submarine goes to war, you've got all these men in the submarine doing different things. Yeah. And, and you have to understand, um, you have to stack everybody's vocation teleologically, right? So um, suppose you go into the cook, the crew's mess, and you say, hey, are you, are you fighting the enemy? You say, no, I'm cooking eggs. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you're not just cooking eggs. You're cooking eggs to feed the sailors who are going to go to the torpedo room. Who are, you know? Yeah. Um, so you have all these different. It, it, Paul would describe it as body life. There are different functions. The the livers the liver is not fighting the enemy. The heart is not fighting the enemy. The, the hands and the, uh, may maybe, but the everything else, the supply core. Yes. <laughs> right. Is doing its station and God, everybody's performing well at their station. And it's God's responsibility to have it all blend together. Right. You know, he's, he's the one who gives the increase. He's the one who per supplies the coordination. We don't do that. Yeah. So I think what I like to encourage people to hear from us 
is, is not this overblown sort of insane optimism that doesn't even take into consideration the facts of the world. We're saying that there is suffering, there is trouble, there, is, there are trials ahead of right. us, but that God can do mighty things and that there is guaranteed full assurance of what he's going to do in the world, which means that, and I think it's important to talk about, because you gave a sermon once that was really, really a blessing to me. You talked about how, how God works in history is from mustard seeds, which means that I can have hope that God is doing big things in the world and that I can trust his promises, and I can do that with just my family and the business that he's given to me and the little community around me there is real genuine hope for tremendous gospel transformation right. there. Right. Yeah. Don't despise the day of small beginnings, as, right. it, as, it, as it says in uh, the, the prophets. So don't despise the day of small beginnings. We're, we're faced with a pagan civilization, and, and Christians say, we could, never over, over, we could never overcome that. I said, well, we did it once. Yeah. Right. If, if, we, if we build Christendom 2.0, it, yeah. it would be Christendom 2.0, yeah. right? But paganism used to rule the world, That's right. and now it doesn't. Constantine stopped the blood sacrifices, the pagan blood sacrifices, which is one of the most momentous events in the history of the world. Uh, so you had the temple destroyed in 70 AD where the Jews stopped offering blood sacrifice. But centuries later, Constantine put a stop to animal sacrifice in the, in the pagan world. Yeah because the Christians had won. Yeah. All right, so, uh, and the Christians had won with no divisions, no arsenals, no armories, no. What, what, did, we, what did we have? Yeah, we got beaten up a lot. <laughs> got beaten up a lot. Yeah. And, the, and the saying of the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. That's right. So that happened once. What, what on earth makes us think it couldn't happen again? On top of that, what, what on earth makes us think it isn't happening again? All right, so if you look at how Africa is, how rapidly Africa, is becoming Christian. How rapidly Christianity is making inroads among Muslims in Africa. Mm -hmm. When you look at what's happening in South America, when you look at the global South, mm -hmm. Philip Jenkins' books, The Next Christendom, and yeah. um, oh, there's another one. Um, it, he's yeah. written a couple of books. Um, it's, it's happening as we speak, yeah. <laughs> right? And we are tr fearful and uh, full of unbelief. So go back to Rid uh, Latimer and Ridley. So. Latimer says to Ridley, play the man, we've got them now, we're, you know, he's, it's, go get them, to, let's take that hill, right? Yeah. And, but a modern North American evangelical is sitting in his lazy boy with his remote, uh, watching the news on the big flat screen that's mounted on the wall, and, he's, and he watches the news and some terrible story, and he turns it off, and he goes into the um, kitchen to talk to his wife, and he opens the fridge, which is a state-of-the-art fridge, and he and he takes out a cold drink and he closes the fridge and says, honey, it's the last days. It's <laughs> <laughs> so funny. It's, it's just terrible out there. Yeah. And, and Latimer and Ridley and the martyrs and the virgins being thrown to the lions in the Colosseum, they, they've got this, we can do it. We can take these guys. Yeah. Right? And they did. And we have astounding resources at our disposal. Yes. And we say we can't can't do it. We can't do it. And we don't. 